Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us. My name is Carolyn Gregoire and I'm the events manager here at Tricycle. This is the second in a series of virtual conversations that we're hosting on a new anthology, Secularizing Buddhism, New Perspectives on a, a Dynamic Tradition, published by our friends at Shambhala Publications. As the book's title suggests, this week's conversations will explore secularization as a dynamic process that's changing the way that we think and talk about what Buddhism is and the way we practice Buddhism in the modern world. Today's Zoom session will be recorded for anyone who's unable to attend live and will make it available on Tricycle's YouTube channel. The link is posted in the chat in case you'd like to share it with friends or you'd like to watch it again. We're providing these events for free so if you haven't already and would like to support Tricycle, please consider giving at the donation link in the chat. You can also find a link in the chat for 30% off the book. So we'll leave some time for Q&A at the end of this hour long session. And you can take a, sorry, you can ask a question by typing it into the Q&A tab on the bottom of the screen. So I'm going to hand it over to our guests today. Our guests are Funi Su and Chin Zing Han. Funi Su is Associate Professor of American Studies at San Jose State University. She holds a PhD from the University of California, Berkeley, an Ed M from the Harvard Graduate School of Education, and a BA from the University of California at Davis. Her prior experience as an elementary school teacher informs her scholarship on education, empire, Buddhism, mindfulness, and race. She's the author of the forthcoming book, Instructions for Erasing Empire, English, Domestication, and the U.S. Colonization of the Philippines. Chen Sing Han is the author of Be the Refuge, Raising the Voices of Asian American Buddhists. She holds a BA from Stanford University, an MA in Buddhist Studies from the Graduate Theological Union, and a Certificate in Buddhist Chaplaincy from the Institute of Buddhist Studies in Berkeley, California. So welcome to you both. Thank you so much for being here. And I will hand it over to you, Chen Sing. Thank you so much, Carolyn. And I just want to thank again, Tricycle and Shambhala for hosting us today. Thank you to the many people who are here with us today joining us. And I know perhaps some of you were here yesterday too to hear Dr. Payne in conversation with James Shaheen. That was a great conversation to kick off this series. Um, yeah, I don't know if, any, if you want to say a few words before I kind of like dive into questions about your wonderful chapter in this book. Thank you, Sunshine. Uh, I just wanted to say hi to everyone and that I'm very appreciative of this opportunity to be participating in this book talk series. And I also wanted to extend my gratitude to Tricycle and Shambhala and Dr. Richard Payne for including me um, and my book chapter in this latest book of his. And I should say congratulations to all of you. If I'm not mistaken, today is launch day for the book. So I hope people will pick up a copy as they're able. I've read the whole book and just it's a really excellent volume, really thought provoking. So I'm so excited we get this opportunity for me to really dig into your chapter today. So in the editor's introduction, Dr. Payne notes that your chapter really shows us that secularization is not value neutral. It's not context free. So it's a it's this kind of process that, as you point out, racialization is a very important part of it. And he praises you for writing about this with the urgency that accompanies societal violence against minorities. So your title is, or your chapter is titled American Cultural Baggage, the Racialized Secularization of Mindfulness in Schools. And I think you open right away by vividly illustrating this kind of urgency, really this kind of violence. So you share that quote, as one who was raised in an Asian American immigrant Buddhist household, the path to publicly identifying as Buddhist was fraught with uncertainty and U-turns. Having experienced several episodes of overt racial religious discrimination during my youth in concerted conservative Orange County, California, end quote. And then you go on to write about the brutal murder of 24 year old Vietnamese American Buddhist Tian Min Lee by a white supremacist in Orange County. So, you know, I only learned of Lee's tragic death through you actually, when we co-organized earlier this year with Dr. Duncan Williams, the May We Gather National Buddhist Memorial Ceremony for Asian American ancestors. And I think perhaps many people in the audience today would have attended that or are familiar with May We Gather. 
And uh, for those of you who did attend, you'll know that Tianmin Li was one of the names on the memorial tablet. So I wanted to open us up today as a first question, just to invite you, Funi, to share a bit more about your personal connection with Li and also why you chose to open your chapter with his story. Thank you, Tenshin, for that really thoughtful question. I wanted to start this conversation in the chapter that I contributed on secularizing Buddhism uh, by highlighting a dynamic of secularization and this process that I feel doesn't get enough attention. Um, and in fact, I feel quite rarely is the topic of race sort of integrated into the discourse around secularization, whether it be seculariz secularization writ large or secularization within Buddhism itself. So not only did I wanted to highlight this component that becomes invisible within secularization and and I argue it's part of the very way that it functions. I also wanted to showcase um, and make very explicit and upfront the real life impact that the racial component of secularization has on the lived realities of uh, people who experience the sort of racial formation side of secularization. And specifically here, I'm talking about Asian American Buddhists. So I start with the story um, to give this chapter and this conversation uh, a human quality that often gets left out of the picture. And I wanted to, in essence, bring attention to the way that secularization within the United States um, is always shaped by race, and I should say, and extend that to the context of North America in general, um, it's always shaped by race. And I can talk about that a little bit later on. And the story of Tim and Lee and um, having to encounter in an explicit way his death um, on my high school campus was a way that I not only learned that as Asian American Buddhists, we are ulterior, and that our visibility will be met with violence. But it was in this specific circumstance, um, sort of a confirmation of that reality. So it was something that not only did I, did I learn that I already know that about what happens when somebody is Asian American and Buddhist, but it showcases this ongoing legacy of exclusion that is at the foundation of the development of American Buddhism in the United States. Um, and to be more clear, that is the exclusion of Asian immigrants, the first Chinese immigrants, and also um, the first population of practicing Buddhists to come to the United States. So Avery Gordon, the sociologist Avery Gordon talks about these structures of power as a kind of haunting. And I believe that many Asian American Buddhists, even without knowing this history, even without reading Asian American history or Asian American Buddhist history, um, we have this knowledge of the violence of this legacy and the ongoing nature of this haunting that we carry with us. And the story of Tim and Lee was an example for me of the lived reality and the effective realm of this kind of racial haunting um, and racial religious haunting in the United States. And secularization gets wrapped up in all of the complexity of this structure of haunting. Um, I also wanted to highlight that in this case of Tim and Lee, um, as I mentioned, I, this happened at my high school when I was a student. And I remember just, I talk about this in the chapter, I remember being in class and it was like zero period or first period or something like that, or it was early in the morning in January. And suddenly um, our typical morning gets interrupted by a loud announcement on the PA system that a body had been found, um, the, the body it of, is of somebody who is deceased. We didn't really have any details about that. And um, so the police were on scene, that's what we were told. And there was some nervous laughter in the classroom and a lot of just uh, feeling of shock. And I remember I talked to my sister about this recently after May We Gather, um, 
because she was also in high school at that time. And she remembers that there was a period where we didn't know who the murderer was. And, and it, there was just complete fear about um, what happened and why and all that. We did know as the news developed that it was an Asian American person, that in fact, this person was Vietnamese American. And some of the news reports started to um, reveal more details. Um, some of them reported that he was a devout Buddhist practitioner, but not all of the news reports capture that aspect of his life. So that was something that really stood out to me in, in detail. And um, what's interesting, and I think quite revealing of this structure of the legacy of uh, the haunting of, of the way that race and religion have worked together to create and form a racial process for Asian Americans is that to the murder who turned out to be a white supremacist, um, a, a young man um, who later on boasted about the murder and the stabbing. Um, he killed Tim Lee by stabbing him a, a number of times. I think it was like over 20 times. So he later boasts about it in a letter and claimed that he killed a Jap. He killed a Jap. So in many ways, it wasn't so much that Tim Inley was Buddhist that he was stabbed, but also in many ways, that's completely irrelevant because of the way that the racialization of Tim as quote unquote, a Jap um, kind of already includes that component of him being this other um, and Jap then encapsulates the stereotypes of uh, Asian American immigrants um, and Asian Americans in general being kind of foreign to the United States. And part of that foreignness is through religious practice and a religious practice that's deemed as un uncivilized and not Christian and therefore not belonging to the United States. So it was a really, um, I think, concise way for me to get out at so many different things that I wanted to explore in the chapter. And it was also a way um, for me to sort of honor this person that I did not know, but that I had really grown up with and that I had developed um, an understanding of myself as an Asian American and myself as an Asian American Buddhist in kinship with because of what happened. And being able to then recognize him as an ancestor at May We Gather was a really important way to acknowledge that sort of kinship and that history. Wow, thank you, Funi. That's such a powerful answer. I'm thinking just what a powerful karmic connection you formed with him and also through your telling his story, allowing us actually to form this kinship, this karmic connection with him. And I'm thinking it's 25 years later and you know, your word haunting feels so perfect because so many of these same strands are still so relevant today and how we can focus on racialization and forget that there's such an important religious dimension to that as religious minorities, as Asian American Buddhists. And on, I also just, just really on, appreciate. Up, up, um, up, up. I think that maybe there's someone who could mute themselves. Sorry about that. If there is some background noise there for a minute, but I'm thinking about how for haunting, just I so appreciate your chapter bringing both this human and historical dimension um, for us really to the fore. And in a way, I suppose that word haunting always implies, well, it connects us to the human and also connects us to histories, to the historical. So there's so much, oh my goodness, we could come up with maybe 20 more questions just based on your answer to that last question alone. But I wanted to make sure that, you know, we talk maybe if we could dig in a bit more about the racialized elements of secularization to kind of, expand on that a bit. So you write that the secularization of Buddhist practices, especially mindfulness, must be read in the context of Asian racial and religious exclusion in the United States. And your chapter really helps us see that these dynamics don't just occur on an individual level in the present day, but again, that we need to think about them structurally, systemically, also on a historical level. So can you just unpack for us a bit more this relationship between secularization and race? Of course. So I listened to the talk yesterday um, between James and Richard, and I 
really appreciated several things um, that Richard said. And, and one of the things that he highlighted was how secularization didn't happen in a vacuum and it developed alongside political economic um, currents during the time period. Notably, he referenced um, rapid industrialization at the, uh, the late 19th century, um, uh, rapid mechanization as well. So secularization coincides with other major world developments that were happening. And among these major world developments, um, uh, it's interesting to note how racial uh, formation through the process of settler colonialism gets overlooked. But in fact, within the context of North America, the very creation of what we now understand as the United States um, and Canada, um, these, and, uh, these are places that have been intimately shaped by the violence of indigenous genocide and settler colonialism. So already we have that foundation of processes of secularization within this area being formed by uh, not just race, but also by a settler colonial process that has been shaped by an epistemological endeavor. Um, one that sought to eradicate indigenous people, but indigenous, also indigenous life ways as part of the overall um, attempted genocide. And because settler colonialism, as Patrick Wolf reminds us, is not a single one-time event, it's ongoing, that we're still living through it, um, we're still occupying this area. Secularization, um, whether it's this contemporary form or this longer history that it comes from, is embedded in a racial process. And when it comes to the more specific understanding of the secularization of Buddhism within North America, um, then we, also must attend to that historical reality that I talked about um, earlier, which is the exclusion of Asian Americans and Asian American Buddhists. Um, and also um, it gets quite complicated within this reality because, because Asian American immigrants, labor immigrants um, have also participated within the secular, uh, settler occupation. So there are nuances and complexities with understanding how race functions within the secularization of Buddhism because of the layered context of conquest. Um, and also the other dimension that is important to note um, about the secularization of race, uh, how secularization and race are intertwined in American Buddhism um, is in regard to uh, this metaphor that I actually want to borrow from Richard's talk yesterday. Uh, and he mentions this, he mentions this in the introduction when he uses the idea of a landscape to talk about the process of secularization. And so um, part of the landscape, and I, I kind of like this idea of landscape and I, I sort of add on to that, this notion of a built environment to think about the process of secularization because it helps us unearth some of the assumptions embedded with it. And I think if we think about secularization as this kind of built environment, it gets to that um, kind of like geological uh, differentiation of the layers that are involved. And part of that is um, this sedimentation of race. And, and I, it kind of takes us back to this notion of haunting that's embedded with that, within that. Um, but how for Asian Americans um, and the specifically the first Asian immigrants uh, who came in what's often referred to as the first large uh, wave of migrants to the United States, um, the Chinese, um, and they're also often acknowledged as the first population of practicing Buddhists. Um, their racialization is formed in conjunction with this notion of being um, a religious other, with being heathen. And Lloyd and Khan, they have a really excellent book on um, race and secularism, and they argue that secularism is in fact a process of exclusion and management and that secularization happens um, through a process of reinforcing whiteness, that there is a racial power dynamic. Um, so uh, 
that tie between um, their definition of secularization and secularism involving exclusion brings us back to that racial component of the Asian American uh, immigrant Buddhists that first brought Buddhism to the United States and that very history that they faced as the first um, racial and ethnic group to be formally banned from immigrating to the United States through um, a legislative act that specifically called for the exclusion in 1882. So these are just some of the ways that race and secularization are intertwined in Buddhism. And because of the way that secularization happens, since it is, as Lloyd and Khan talk about, a process of exclusion, a process of management, we don't get to discuss these sediments that are embedded within this built environment of secularization. Um, it doesn't become part of the discourse. And I think that it's really when those who are forced into a position of alterity, Asian American Buddhists, when we start to realize that that affective quality of feeling um, the omnipresence of the violence, that's knowing that it's always there. Um, when that starts to surface that, that um, we can use that affective dimension as a kind of wisdom um, and, and kind of get deeper to digging through those sediments and getting to that haunting that is always present. Yeah, I really appreciate this metaphor. That's such a rich metaphor. And thinking of how your chapter and really all the other chapters in the book really helped me think about secularization, which sometimes I think can be very flat or we forget that it's a process that's always ongoing, always with these historical dimensions, always racialized as you so helpfully help us understand, you know, we just kind of take the ground beneath our feet for granted and we forget to think, really examine the bedrock of our assumptions of our lived experiences. And I guess to take this metaphor, I wonder if you can you know, give us an example of maybe something that's built on this environment. In other words, what's an example that's really at this intersection of race and secularization in American Buddhism? What might be some of the you know, buildings or is it rocks or formations that we encounter that we, when we really start is exploring this landscape more carefully? Um, I feel like one of the primary examples in which we see this intertwining dimension of race and secularization and Buddhism is through the popularization of mindfulness practice. And I think that it's no coincidence that there are several chapters in this collection that are talking about mindfulness within this larger conversation regarding the secularization of Buddhism. So that's one dimension that we can understand um, how these different forces are at play. And I should also clarify that when I'm talking about the secularization of mindfulness um, as part of this larger conversation about secularizing Buddhism, I'm approaching it from the perspective of uh, secular meaning trying to make something not religious. Um, so trying to make, uh, something that uh, here the something is the practice of mindfulness, um, not part of this religious tradition of Buddhism. So uh, the chapter goes on to, to discuss the specific context of mindfulness in school. So that's kind of a little bit of the, the um, background for why I approach it in this way, because I'm looking at it in regards to democratic ideals, American democratic ideals around um, the First Amendment and this idea of not having an established religion um, and that kind of constitutional constraint in, in dealing with schools and dealing with the way that religion can or cannot surface in schools. So um, in that kind of way, I look at mindfulness and this question of secularism um, and the way that race is intertwined with that. But I think that the patterns that we see with what happens in schools can also in many regards be seen um, as echoing through larger conversations about mindfulness in different social spaces, whether it's in corporate spaces, um, Ron Purser talks more about that component, um, or in kind of individual practice amongst people who don't identify as Buddhist or perhaps identify under the label as secular Buddhist. Um, there are certain themes that 
are carried across through all of them in, in several ways. Um, and it can't help but be carried across because we're talking about a structure of race and settler conquest and the way Asian Americans are participating in that Asian American immigrant Buddhists and Asian Americans um, and that legacy of the haunting of exclusion. It's just, it's built into that. So I also make very clear in the book in several places that I'm not so concerned about individuals who identify as secular Buddhists and, and whether or not I think that they are racist. That's really not the question that I'm interested in. And in fact, I talk about how I think trying to parse individual attitudes and individual behaviors is a distraction from looking at the structure. And that's really where I'm looking at my analysis. And I think mindfulness as this larger social phenomenon that's really exploded in the recent decades um, is a way for us to be able to start pulling apart the pieces or start digging through the layers to get at the embedded um, assumptions within secularization. Yeah, and schools are just such a potent site of inquiry, right, as we're talking about exclusion management. I mean, that schools themselves as this structure, it's um, so, yeah, I mean, and also I think you yourself have a very keen interest, a personal passion for this as a professor, but also as someone who taught in the Los Angeles Unified School District. Uh, with So you have these many both, you know, personal and professional connections to an interest in this topic. And it's something, you know, and I, I also really love how in this chapter you, you really question these notions of what is universal. There's these sort of rhetorics of inclusion that, in fact, when we dig a little deeper, we see the kinds of dynamics of exclusion that are actually at play. And something I just wanted to ask you is when it comes to these mindfulness programs in schools, which just seem to be really proliferating, what are some of the questions that you wish that educators, that parents and students were asking about these programs? That's a great question. Um, actually, I'd like to take this question in two parts and, and sort of expand a little bit on some of the details that you mentioned in regards to my take on mindfulness, the secularization of mindfulness in schools and just give a little bit more background information on that and then get to the question about um, what do I wish that parents would ask? Um, and if I forget that question, can you remind me? I might just get so, so <laughs> interested in the first component and kind of uh, <laughs> forget. Absolutely. Thanks, Senshi. Um, but to give some more detail on that aspect of the exclusion and how it surfaces in the secularization of mindfulness for schools, um, what's really interesting is that we're operating within the context of schools and, as I mentioned, the constitutional constraints that are guided by the First Amendment and this mandate of the separ separation of church and state um, because it's a public institution. Um, that there is this sort of Western humanist democratic ideal of um, in inclusion and that secularism is the best way to achieve inclusion because there's this assu assumed neutrality within secularism. And so a lot of the conversation, a lot of the language and the articulation of um, removing religion from schools, and this definitely applies to the context and the debates about mindfulness in schools, um, is in regards to wanting to set an inclusive environment so nobody feels that they're left out or nobody feels like they're being um, uh, proselytized to, et cetera. Um, but what happens in this attempt to ensure inclusion through um, an assertion of secularity and an assertion of mindfulness as a secular process and, and something that has really nothing to do with Buddhism or has no longer anything to do with Buddhism. That's often the two ways that um, there's a distancing from Buddhism that happens through the secularization of mindfulness for schools is that there in fact is the opposite um, phenomenon that, that occurs that um, belies the intent of inclusion and that is an exclusion through this process of negation and that negation happens through what I just mentioned kind of distancing mindfulness and its relationship to Buddhism and we can have long conversations about um, mindfulness and is it Buddhist and all that kind of stuff and in fact uh, it's it's a very long conversation that's been explored in the literature and lots of the components of that conversation 
is part of the continuation of the exclusion and the management of um, more explicitly, I think people can understand the, the racial exclusion, I mean, the religious exclusion and management of Buddhism, but what never gets talked about is the racial exclusion and management that happens. Um, well, maybe I should say sometimes the racial component gets talked about, but it's in regards to um, black and brown students and um, not, Brown students as they're understood as Asian American, I should say. So, and so therefore no real conversation about Asian Americans. And I would even go so far as to say never any conversation about Asian Americans within um, this understanding of secularism and uh, the way that it's used to offer a kind of mindfulness for schools. And I should also qualify by this by saying that I'm not um, against some of the expressed intentions of why educators um, might advocate for mindfulness in schools. And, and there are many uh, varieties of, of explanations for why um, school districts and schools themselves and teachers themselves might want to bring mindfulness in schools. Um, some of them I find to be really important causes. Um, and some of them I'm not so aligned with, but it's again, the structure and the process that I'm concerned with and the fact that they often go unexamined and in regards to the racial element as it concerns Asian Americans and has very real impacts. Again, returning to Tim and Lee and my experience in school, um, that part never gets discussed and that's what I'm concerned with. So uh, to get back to the other part of your question or, or the real question that you had about what I wish parents would ask uh, about mindfulness programs, I would categorize um, mm, my desired inquiry of parents or from parents under the broad umbrella of examining power dynamics. Um, who has the power to express what these mindfulness programs are? How are they defining what is secular and what is not secular? And um, again, going back to the conversation between James and Richard Payne yesterday, um, Richard was talking about how the ability to decipher what is the core teachings of Buddhism and separate other things, that's all about power. And um, that happens with claiming that a practice is secular, being able to decide what part is religious and what part is not religious, that's all about power. So I would ask parents to inquire about um, how secularism is being defined and who, who gets to decide that? Um, what, what are they drawing from? Also, who has the power to be the experts in defining what is secular? What are the secular components of mindfulness and what are not the secular components of mindfulness? Um, what kind of framework that's being expressed in? Oftentimes it's in the framework of science and, and language and um, that has a longer history within Buddhist modernism for different reasons. Um, that I think are quite important. Um, and I would ask parents to not just to think about who has the power, but, but for whom is, is power being maintained and who is being excluded, but not just who is being excluded, but for whom is this exclusion being naturalized? And perhaps even um, for whom is this exclusion an ongoing part of the naturalization of uh, these people in society as being not those people who have power and not deserving of power and not the people that have expert knowledge. Those are just some of the questions. Yeah, those are powerful questions. I so appreciate you really just surfacing them for us, right? I think sometimes just with this kind of professed neutrality, actually what that can lead to is a sort of just apathy. And what I really appreciate about your chapter, about this conversation, as you're so you know powerfully embodying that you're really inviting us into a critical inquiry together, a kind of collective critical inquiry into these themes that we might not have before seen as being interrelated, but they're very much so. And I'm, I'm glad you brought up you know science as well. I think that's another big point around I mean, even histories of science and technology are themselves so racialized and so we can see how these many of these strands are so interwoven and it takes it's work it takes work to really start to separate them and start to interrogate them a bit so okay I think we have maybe about 10 more minutes before we want to open it up to audience questions so let me see if we might be able to squeeze in one or two more questions from me to you um yeah, so 
one of the questions I also had was, in many ways, your chapter is about the invisibility of Buddhism in secularized mindfulness programs that proclaim to be universal and implicitly race neutral. So if we turn the tables a bit, what happens when we center a Buddhist perspective? What does this Buddhist view tell us about race and secularization? Okay, so uh, I think I'd like to approach this again from two perspectives. So one is the Buddhist view, but I also don't proclaim to, to be a Buddhist studies person. I'm American studies and education. So I would like to then take it in a, a second direction, which is thinking um, about what does an understanding of the historical development of American Buddhism offer to our conversation about race and uh, secularization and Buddhism. So in the first regard, I think that part of the dynamic conversation that um, is being built around the notion of no self and um, sp specifically as no self relates to ways in which Buddhists can work through race and racial injustice, um, I think is uh, a way that we can draw in conversations about dependent co-arising that then integrate um, a broader understanding of race in the United States. So it's interesting because in so much as Buddhist practice provides ample opportunity for us to think about going beyond dualisms, um, the conversation about race in the United States and even race within American Buddhist sanghas is still very much one that operates within a dualistic framework of white and black. Um, and that's quite fascinating because of the history of the development of American Buddhism being the way that it is, um, being so attributed to um, the racial and religious management exclusion of these Chinese immigrant Buddhists and everyone that came after that, um, the Japanese American Buddhists, Southeast Asian Buddhists, South Asian Buddhists, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that um, the Buddhist view provides us a way to kind of get into the conversation by thinking about this um, dependent coal rising and a, a more vast understanding of race as a framework within the United States. And then I would argue that the understanding of the historical development of American Buddhism not only provides an opportunity for us to integrate Asian American Buddhists um, and take them seriously in a way that I don't think American Buddhism has before and just general conversations about race in North America has ever done before. Um, not only does it provide that opportunity, I think it requires us as American Buddhists to take Asian American Buddhists seriously because it is the root of American Buddhism in the United States. So conversations about uh, race, Buddhism, secularism, um, definitely need to acknowledge and recognize that history. And when I say it's fascinating that it doesn't, um, it's because that's part of how the process of exclusion and management happens. Again, I, I talked about that earlier, but um, it's always, interesting to confront that again and to see the way that it operates and see the way that it surfaces. So those are two ways that I can think of in which um, these kind of specific ways of folding in Buddhism and the history of American Buddhism can help us expand the scope of our conversation. Thanks, Funi. Okay, I think I can squeeze in one more question, short but not simple. <laughs> What can people do to become more aware of the ways that Asian American Buddhists are racialized? So I'm thinking of two um, immediate anecdotal references. Um, and one of them is reading some of the feedback from May We Gather. And I remember somebody who, um, described herself as I think being a white Buddhist teacher and having watched May We Gather and coming to a, a different understanding of what the context and the foundations of Buddhism in the United States was and being really impacted in that effective dimension, effective quality, as I was mentioning earlier. And I think mentioned something about um, 
like being in, having to spend the next day in bed, just like soaking it all in. I think that's a really uh, deep understanding and the kind of necessary way of reconditioning ourselves to think about race and Buddhism and the place of Asian American Buddhists, um, because Buddhism has been part of our racial formation. I, I think that's what people have a, a difficult time understanding uh, in many ways to no fault of their own, because that's what this structure structures. Um, but uh, I think there needs to be a process of reconditioning and that people can engage in that process of reconditioning. It can be something that is part of a, a doable component of the practice. And, and so the second antidote um, I have is actually related to an academic um, book that I read, which was This Worldly Nibbana by Shalon Hu. And um, Shalon talks about no self and talks about karma and theorizes no self and karma from a feminist social ethic. And um, really, Z is concerned with um, interrogating, interrogating dynamics of gender. And um, coincidentally, Shaolin also uses this notion of sedimentation, this, this idea that there are certain behaviors that we engage in that are um, so built into how we operate because they're so built into the larger structure. And then Shaolin offers a way for us to, to move with this so that we can go beyond these conditioned behaviors um, and Z talks about this idea of reconditioning. And that's, that's kind of where I was borrowing that term for. And I actually wrote um, a bit about this in a separate chapter that's not part of this book. But I think that um, a, an idea and a practice of reconditioning is really important. And Shalon talks about it in regards to relearning. Once you have an awareness of a kind of suffering that your embedded social behaviors have produced or are continuing to produce. Um, and here I would say the social behavior is out of exclusion of Asian American Buddhists, um, that there can be a, a reconditioning of that knowledge and a reconditioning of the behavior pattern so that you no longer engage in that kind of behavior or at least reduce harm in regards to that behavior as you're working towards um, relieving the suffering that you might be engaged in with this ongoing um, participation in the racial history of exclusion. So I think those those are some ways that um, people can engage with this haunting in a way that could feel feasible in their practice. Mm, that's so powerful. I feel kind of like an invitation to being shaken, to being really stirred like the landscape you know almost like an earthquake in the landscape and then thinking about what are the implications of that I think even Buddhist thinking some way got this idea of you know how in fact much of it is about shaking us to and a way out of our habitual ways of thinking and learning yeah. mm, there's so much here I I want to rewatch the recording of if I this might just add one thing um, because you, what your comment just reminded me of something that I thought was so beautiful about what um, Richard said yesterday about uh, practice as a discipline. And um, I think the context was somebody was asking about, um, I'm going to get it wrong, so I'm not even going to try, but he was talking about the practice, practice as a discipline and that um, what it does is that it changes you. And I think that this idea of reconditioning is exactly that it's something that changes you. And um, in fact, we always are changing. As Buddhists, we know that. Um, but I think with this intentionality, intentionality be, uh, behind reconditioning, particularly in regards to the exclusion, the racial exclusion and management that happens with secularization, that we can be changed in ways that um, can um, being motivated by a reduction of harm um, and a sort of intentionality that I think that this society during uh, this time needs more of. Yeah, very related to uh, Dr. Hu's question of uh, uh, writing about social ethics, the feminist social ethic. Mm -hmm. So there are lots of questions and I'm going to try to see if I think it's now would be a good time to turn to the audience questions. Thank you everyone for submitting all of these thoughtful questions. You know, here's maybe a short one that since we're talking about ethics, um, 
Uh, someone wants to know, does mindfulness in public schools have any moral teaching components included? That there's so many different programs, mindfulness-based programs, often kind, oftentimes they're called MBPs for short, um, that it's really in many ways hard to talk about them as this like whole unified thing because uh, there are different uh, people who are creating programs and, and sometimes um, they create it in ways that are distinct from other programs. And to give a more clear example, sometimes yoga is considered part of mindfulness programs and sometimes it's not. Um, so even what is mindfulness is, is a really tricky topic. And that's why there's often, um, it's difficult to assess the data for mindfulness in schools, like how many schools actually use mindfulness. Um, so I would say that that question really depends on um, particular MVPs that you're looking at, whether or not they have this moral quality. And within the, the educational literature on mindfulness in schools, um, there is a debate about whether or not a moral ethic is just intrinsically embedded in mindfulness. Um, and, and that's one of the areas that we can see kind of being reflected in the larger conversation about uh, secular mindfulness in, in the general public and in, in larger social arenas, like whether or not there is an intrinsic, intrinsic moral ethical component to it. Um, so in some ways there are parallels to that debate in schools. Um, but again, it's really hard to decipher because there are just so many different programs operated by different organizations with different intentions. Mm, thank you for reminding us, yeah, that mind mindfulness in schools itself is not a monolith. You know, here's an interesting question also related. Um, given the American political and social environment, do you think it's best to avoid teaching mindfulness in public schools because of its racial whitewashing? Or are the individual and potential societal benefits mindfulness too important to not teach it in public schools or other such places? I, this is a really interesting question. I mean, it sounds like such a basic question to ask somebody who researches mindfulness in schools. And, and in many ways, I think I, I often come across as somebody who's like against mindfulness, mindfulness, but I'm not necessarily, again, what I am very concerned about is the structures and the way that it operates and the kinds of logical assumptions that it util utilizes in order to make its way into schools. Um, and, and I would say that, um, Oftentimes, there are structural supports that can be offered in schools that can also achieve some of the same objectives that are, um, that are being cited as the purposes for mindfulness in schools. And, and um, I'm very much interested in those structural supports that can be offered that are, are not necessarily mindfulness, because I also question what is the intention of having mindfulness in schools? What is spurring this recent fervor to uh, integrate mindfulness in schools? And I believe that not only is there a racial component in the, um, what I call the exclusionary negation of uh, mindfulness from Buddhism, but I, there is a, a racial component in kind of the enticing uh, motivation for incorporating mindfulness in schools that also needs to be examined. So. I kind of steer away from that question in general and say, well, what about these supports? And I'm talking about like mental health support, therapists, counselors, et cetera, for students, um, music programs. Those are things that um, are um, secular in ways that doesn't get into the question of religion. And oftentimes those are supports that have been defunded over the decades that um, I am very much curious about uh, conversations regarding reinstituting them or reestablishing them or putting them into so certain schools that perhaps might not have had them in the first place um, instead of conversations about mindfulness. Mm, yeah, I hear you questioning kind of to how mindfulness fits into an overall ecosystem in education and trying to broaden out the landscape. What are the effects of if mindfulness really expands, what else might be shrinking as a result? And so to take a bigger picture look at that and trying to just even understand descriptively what's going on, not necessarily, you know, I think we have to start there before maybe we can even make any pre prescriptive or policy decisions. Um, there are so many questions, so I apologize to everyone who's, uh, 
those questions we aren't going to be able to get to in our last 10 minutes together. Here's one that actually, Funi, while you and I were preparing for this conversation, we anticipated there might this question might come up. So um, what are your thoughts on the connections between secularization and cultural appropriation? The question of cultural appropriation is always so interesting to me. Um, so first of all, I'd like to say that I'm, I am interested in the ways that appropriation are used um, in a Marxist sense and the way that, um, so there's like in that Marxist sense, there's a way that there is ownership that is being asserted, not just in regards to Buddhism and mindfulness of a particular religious technique, but going back to sort of the earliest form of appropriation, um, there is a connection to nature and this overall sense of establishing this notion of ownership over something that can then be commodified as an object and then put into a market of exchange, um, a monetary exchange. So I'm interested in thinking about mindfulness as it fits within that kind of appropriation economic ecosystem. And um, I think that conversations about cultural appropriation are in many ways helpful because they get us started thinking about, well, what in fact are the power dynamics? And then I would urge for us to think more about getting deeper into that conversation. So it's not simply on the level of culture, um, but it's also interrogating dimensions of power that look at these longer histories of exploitation that uh, include labor, um, and that include the ways that labor and race and gender um, and class are, are intertwined as well. Um, and I think this goes back to uh, the way that I answered the previous question. So Ron Purser talks about how mindfulness is within the context of neoliberalism. So I talk about neoliberalism when I talk about schools and, and um, that's just something that also needs to be uh, vocally and explicitly addressed when we're talking about mindfulness, that that is part of the political economic system in which this phenomenon is arising. That um, uh, Ron Perster talks about how mindfulness is a way that uh, within ne neoliberalism, we can see how it becomes mechanized to privatize some of the uh, structural conditions that are affecting um, many of us in American society. And by structural conditions, I mean um, all sorts of insecurities, economic insecurity, employment insecurity, housing insecurity, et cetera. Um, but then mindfulness becomes a way to privatize that um, and so that it becomes our individual responsibility. Um, and I think going back to the question about cultural appropriation, we can take it uh, to an area where it starts to take seriously that kind of conversation about um, how does that kind of cultural appropriation facilitate the ongoing neoliberal commodification of a certain type of um, uh, practice that has uh, origins in Buddhism and then kind of shift it so that it becomes a way to emphasize this privatized, individualized way of promoting um, quote unquote well-being. There's oftentimes uh, neoliberalism as uh, an economic ideology claims and purports to be interested in human advancement and well-being. Um, but we can see the dilemmas that's being um, experienced through the ways that mindfulness is, is taken up and operated within uh, a political economic system that operates off and functions off of this sort of appropriation. So it's not just a cultural appropriation, but it's this sort of economic benefit and a way that mindfulness, mindfulness then fits within this larger economic system. Mm. Thank you, Funi. Um, I'm trying to see Oh, there's so many more questions. Uh, here's one that I'm actually quite curious about as well. Is any of your critique relevant outside the US? I know several Asian teachers of secular mindfulness based on programs such as MBSR that were developed in the West in, for example, Taiwan, Hong Kong, Singapore. Curious whether or how your ideas of exclusion applied there. Can you repeat the first part of the question? Yes, is any of your critique relevant outside the US? 
Um, I really, because I am in American studies, I really study the Amer the United States context. I should be more specific. Um, so things that I've noticed outside of the U.S. are kind of more anecdotal. I don't have enough data to draw any real conclusions from that. Um, so anecdotally, I'll, I'll share that in conversations um, and uh, sort of the public discourse that I've seen about mindfulness in places like Taiwan, it is sort of this uh, kind of wave of influence from the United States and specifically related to MBSR that has then moved into um, different spaces in Taiwan. And that's Taiwan is an interesting case because many of the people there are Buddhists in um, varying degrees practice varying degrees of Buddhism. Um, so there is an awareness of meditation an awareness of this idea of mindfulness. Um, but then again, I think there is in the way that the wave of uh, mindfulness coming from the United States is spreading, not just to Taiwan, but has spread to other places around the world. Um, it takes with it the intrinsic racial structures um, that are embedded within secularization and and those ideas, not that they were never in Taiwan because Taiwan is part of the larger global economic system. Um, it kind of gets reintroduced in this new package of mindfulness that then uh, I think performs its own kind of racialization that's not in an American context of race, racialization in places like Taiwan. So I definitely think there's something there. It's just not, um, I don't think we can say that it's the same thing because there's a whole complex dynamic of race within Taiwan and, and each locale has their own intricate um, histories around race. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I appreciate this question for getting us to think also more transnationally about some of these dynamics. So I think maybe we have time for one more question. Here's one about, can you speak to how the language of mindfulness slash Buddhist practice can have racialism embedded in it? For example, the English words we use to convey particular concepts may already internalize racialization. Yeah, so part of my work that I am doing on mindfulness is in regards to language and there's a whole layer of racialization that happens through language um, that surfaces through mindfulness. And in the chapter, I don't remember if I focus so much on, um, on language in regards to vocabulary that can and cannot be used, but what we'll often find is that um, in this rush to assert that mindfulness is secular so that it can be used in schools, um, that exclusionary negation happens. And part of that is the management of language. And so uh, instructors are told, you cannot use this word or you cannot use this word because that sounds too much like it's a religious word. And, and oftentimes it's not even a religious word. It's just a word in a foreign language. It's in a, a word in an Asian language. And so in that kind of process, we'll see um, that this is really not just about is something religious or not. This is about a lot of other things, one of which is race. And so um, definitely there is a function of uh, language that's being integrated. And that's a whole nother topic that I can go on and on about because it's another area that I look at, but um, that's my simple answer for now. Thank you, Fudi. Um, well, I want to thank everyone who's joined us today. I think we're very close to the end of our time together. And I'm actually not sure if um, Carolyn, oh, here you are, <laughs> will come back on. I, thank you, Mike. Right, thank you both so much for that really important and thoughtful conversation. Um, and thank you for everyone who asked questions and joined in. We appreciate your participation. And uh, we have another event coming up tomorrow at 3 p.m. on preserving the path to awakening with Bhikkhu Bodhi and Gil Fonstal. And you know, just wanted to remind everyone that if you'd like to make a donation to support this offering, you can do so at tricycle.org slash donate. And you can also, using the link in the chat, receive 30% off your copy of Secularizing Buddhism. So thank you so much again, Shinseng and Funi, and thank you everyone who joined. And we hope to see you again tomorrow.